So what I'm going to do today is talk about a series of updates, and I'm going to start from a broader view of federal issues, beginning with the Endangered Species Act review on river herring. You've probably heard the river herring has been assessed twice in recent years on the Endangered Species Act review, as has American eel. So there's been a lot of interest in these diatomous fish from an Endangered Species Act perspective. We'd like to see other species considered, so if anybody wants to work on listing rainbow smelt, please consider that. That's a fish that could use some effort too. Then I'm going to cover Atlantic State Marine Fishery Commission stock assessments for river herring and American eel, and then get into some state level management issues, and then give you an update on some of the work that DMF is doing with fish passage work in Massachusetts, and then conclude with our diatomous fish uh, restoration priority list. And I'm guessing we just have time for questions in the end. So beginning with the ESA listing, you might recall in 2013, NOAA considered river herring as an endangered or a threatened species under the ESA review process, and they concluded that it wasn't warranted. They were promptly sued by the Natural Resource Defense Council and Earth Justice, and the groups got together and they decided that NOAA would revisit the, the review process and conclude with a published finding in, in uh, 2019. So this process is underway. What they're doing is they're looking at the determination whether it should be listed as threatened or endangered, and this includes both alewife and blueback. And they're looking at five factors, loss of habitat or range, overutilization, disease or predation, inadequate regulations, or natural and man-made threats that might threaten the existence of these two species. And they're also looking at distinct population segments, and they're really focused on mid-Atlantic blueback. Are they different from other population segments in their range? And so this is ongoing now. I talked to Tara Trinko yesterday with uh, Noah in Gloucester. She's leading the, the regional effort for this review. There was a deadline on comments October 16th, but she said she would still receive comments um, for a little while. So if people have comments, they want to offer data to this process, feel free. Feel free. And uh, Tara's email address is there as well as the website for where the review process information is being held. So let me know if you want to grab that later. So that's the update. Um, EEL was concluded a couple years ago for the second time, and they also found that a listing wasn't warranted. So we could talk now about what's going to happen with Alewife and Blueback, but uh, I think we'll find out soon enough. So let me move on to Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. This is the interstate group that manages migratory fish they cross state boundaries. They manage diatomous fish, American shad, river herring, uh, sturgeon, American eel. They develop sustainable fishery management plans for diatomous fish. They do that for shad and herring. They're working on a process to do this for American eel. They also conduct stock assessments. And this is the group that closed these herring fisheries and shad fisheries to harvest in 2012 if there wasn't a sustainable fishery management plan available. So they conducted a stock assessment, a benchmark stock assessment in 2012, and it really is a difficult assessment. Most assessments are age-based or model-based. In this case, you have many different river systems where the fish leave the rivers, and they interact out in the ocean, and they're harvested. It's very hard to relate that harvest back to the rivers where the fish came from. So it is a complex life history. What they tried to do was assemble data from different river systems. They looked at 57 rivers of which 26 had usable data, and they looked at categories of fishery independent and fishery dependent data, such as uh, by species, alewife and blueback, harvest, catch per unit effort, and different biological characteristics, and they tried to assemble abundance indices and then look at trends for these indices. Most of the run counts that were used occurred in New England, and I should step back and say that most of the abundance indices were run counts. So a lot of folks here are interested in getting better run count information. So this was updated this year. It was a five-year update. They used benchmark data. They took benchmark data and added 2011 to 2015. No new data sets were allowed. That's just part of the process, except those that were identified in the benchmark as having less than 10 years of data but would have 10 years of data by 2015. And I think a couple were added under that clause. Several data sets were discontinued, and in the end, there were 54 rivers that had suitable data for trend analysis, and they did the review from 2006 to 2015. 
Our very own Ben Gehagen was on the Stock Assessment Subcommittee. He's here today, so if you have any detailed questions, feel free to check on Ben later. And here are the results of the trends. And so what they did was they looked at the data in terms of 2006 to 2015, and they assessed the status in terms of increasing, decreasing um, status quo. And what they found among these series, 17 were increasing, two decreasing, eight were stable, 10 had no discernible trends, and 17 didn't have enough data to determine what the trend might be. Of these 54 indices, 29 were run counts. So run counts really factored heavily into this assessment. And of these run counts, 11 were increasing and none were decreasing. So the general trend for that recent period was we, we had more run counts, more indices increasing than decreasing. Despite that, the uh, conclusion was the stock remains depleted. And this is the coastwide meta complex of rear herring stocks is again was found depleted as was during the 2012 benchmark. So that's a quick review. Let me move on to American Eel. And I guess, Abby, we might have, if there's a real burning question, I guess we could go ahead and have folks ask. And if, we don't, if we're running short on time, we can just move past the questions. But please, if you do have a question that pops up, go ahead. So for American Eel, very similar process. There was a 2012 benchmark assessment. It was the first assessment conducted for American Eel. And this was done um, looking at the different life stages for eel. Unlike river herring eel or panmictic, you got a single stock throughout their range, and so it should be easier to assess, but it's really a data poor situation. You have very little information on age structure. So in the end, it's an assembly of, of trends on the East Coast to try to find out what's happening with the stock. So the benchmark information was updated with data from 2010 to 2016. Again, no age structure data. They could not use commercial catch per unit effort. No indices on silver reels. Really a data poor situation. And so they grouped together these different trend analyses for the life stages. A little background. On the left is a graph of commercial landings in the United States. And you can see that large rise in the 70s. And what happened there was the global market increased for American eel and the price really shot up. And so our fishermen all up and down the coast went after eel in the 70s because the price was so much higher and harvest really increased. And this was a response to declining numbers of Japanese eels as well as European eels. So the price went up for our eel and catches really skyrocketed. As that, those catch peaks declined, there was really no change in the market or regulatory process, just the, the numbers of eels declined. And then you can see the recent 20 or so years, the commercial landings are fairly flat. And that's happened again with almost no regulatory impetus behind that. If you look at the Canadian landings to the right, the data doesn't go back quite as far, but you can see a similar trend of higher landings in the 90s, then declining sharply, and then a very low level of stable harvest in recent years. I think it's important to consider that because I just think we don't have the level of abundance that we had not that long ago in these East Coast fisheries. So for the yield assessment, they, they take what they had for abundance indices and they assemble them into indexes. Shown here is the 20-year index, and this is a generalized linear model that takes the different indices, puts them together that are available for 20 years, and then tunes it on the base of different covariates, such as water temperature and flow rates. And you can see the 20-year index is fairly stable. It's only 20 years. The 40-year index, which only I think it's three or four indices, individual indices, shows some of that decline at the beginning of the series and then a very flat period. So the commercial catch data and these fishery independent indices are showing a similar trend in the last 20, 30 years of flat conditions. And then we have our very own Jones River Index. This is just up the road a little ways in Kingston. We have a Sheldon eel trap that produces an index of glass eels. It was started in 2001, and uh, it was accepted in the benchmark as an index of abundance. It's one of only three glass eel indices in New England, so we're very glad to have it. Although we're not so happy about the story that it shows, it's a declining trend. On the left, we have the geometric mean with confidence intervals, and then on the right is the results of the generalized linear model, which is standardized to the same process for all the indices on the East Coast. This one's tuned by water temperature and flow, 
but it has that same general trend that's declining. It's a significant declining trend for the Jones River, as well as six other of these indices on the East Coast. So uh, in summary, they took data from 2010 to 16, added to what was there already. Unlike the river herring assessment, where they focused on 2006 to the present, they looked at the whole time series, and they made their assessment. Once again, very data poor assessment. No information enters this assessment on silver eels at all, which is unfortunate. Uh, Europe, European assessments, for example, are really based on silver eel escapement. So we have none of that information entering this assessment. So let me run through the results. 22 young of the year or glass eel indices on the East Coast. Six of those are significantly declining, including our Jones River. For yellow eel, there's 15 yellow eel indices on the East Coast. Four of these are significantly declining. One is increasing. And the 30 and 40 year coastwide indices are both significantly declining. And contrastly, in the Chesapeake, some of the signs are positive. It seems like the Chesapeake Bay is a center of abundance for eels on our east coast, and those indices are increasing. And then overall, again, we have stable but low level of commercial landings relative to historic levels. So in conclusion, very similar to river herring, they decided to not change the results of the benchmark. The eel stocks on the east coast are considered to be depleted, and, but it's different in the sense that here you have some significant declining trends for the whole time series, where with river herring in the, the most recent time period, you have some significant increasing trends. And I think as we'll, we'll hear more from John Shepard on this a little bit later, but I think what we're seeing is some improvements following the harvest bands on the East Coast led to some recent improvements in river herring. Not so much in historical perspective, but in that time period of 2006 onward. So let me move on to what I do, unless there's any questions on those two stock assessments. And I apologize that with the five minute version, I flew through that very quickly, but um, I served on the Eel Stock Assessment Subcommittee, Ben served on the River Herring, and so we're around to answer questions if you have any later. So what I do is I work for the Recreational Diatomous Fisheries Program as a fisheries biologist. I lead these two pro projects here, and I have my staff here today of John Shepard, Sarah Turner, and Ben Gehagen. Ed Clark isn't here, but I, I really have a fantastic staff. Um, they are a handful to manage, and they're very talented. I don't think they pay me enough to supervise this crew, but uh, they're very talented and very dedicated, and I'm very fortunate to have them. And so what we do is we work a lot with the towns. There are 48 towns that have herring runs on the Massachusetts coastline, and we spend a lot of time interacting with towns. There's over 100 herring runs, over 150 fishways, and so we are very much connected to local management of these herring runs. And so under the project of fish passage and habitat restoration, we do a lot of work with small fishways. We have a DMF fishway crew of one, Ed Clark. Um, this crew was established in 1941, and, it, and for many years it was six or eight staff. And we were down to one individual, so we chip away and do the best we can. We work on small fishways. Ed is just fantastic at fabricating and designing these small wood, aluminum, and concrete fishways. We also collaborate on larger projects via contract or, or collaborations with partners, and we also collaborate on eel passage, channel improvements, and dam removal projects. We have a regulatory role. I think a lot of what we do is driven by state law and regulations that tell us what to do. There are a lot of things we like to do, but we're told to do certain things. And under that regulatory role, we issue DMF fishway construction permits. We write operation and maintenance plans for fishways and we develop memorandums of understanding with private property owners and town property owners for fishways. Those are regulatory documents. We also get wet and dirty at times. We do a lot of fishway maintenance. We get out there and we do some herring stocking, habitat assessments, and run channel maintenance. I'd like to give you a brief update on run channel maintenance. We had a, a talk here last year. Steve Hurley and I addressed the topic it became a little controversial recently and from two sides of the, of the perspective. From my point of view, I think a lot of areas are not being maintained. Since we've had the harvest ban, some areas, some towns are not dedicating as much resources towards this work. And I think we're seeing a lot of these channels starting to grow in and become obstructed. So I, I, I see a greater need to do this work. 
At the same time, there are folks who are interested in impacts to other aquatic resources, principally brook trout habitat. So I think a discussion was warranted. We had that discussion last year, and I think it was fruitful. A little more history. I think towns have done this type of work. These fish have to travel from saltwater to freshwater habitats. They need to have some, sometimes they need a boost. They need help getting up. And the towns have done this work for ages. And the state got involved in the 1930s when laws were put in place because most herring runs, not most, but a large majority were privatized, where private companies were selling the herring. And there was a lot of impacts and over harvest. So state laws came in. It got DMF involved, and we started becoming active with some of this channel maintenance as well. And in 2007, we were asked to develop a plan in Essex related to beaver problems, and since then we've developed 10 plans. So I just want to encourage folks to, to be aware of this issue. I think we're getting better at the way we do it, and, but I think it's also the need has never been stronger. We've had a couple near drought years, and under those conditions, plants really grow into these channels and can really choke off some areas. So I, I think it's a topic that we have to keep talking about and keep finding a way to do a better job with this. In 2017, we didn't do as much work as normal. I think we didn't really get our spring technicians out working on some of these projects, but we were active in three areas. The Four River Watershed in Braintree. We were out there. South River in Marshfield just a couple weeks ago. We were out there, we, we found some, you know, impediments that really surprised us at how much some of the water willow had grown in and choked off the stream. Then the Akushnet River and the Akushnet needs attention as well, and we'll be out there doing some work um, soon. And also the point about low flow. I, I really think 2015 and 16 low flows really got me thinking about what's happening in some of these channels. Surface flows are just not strong enough in some cases to keep these channels scoured out. And so some physical work is needed to make the passageways free for fish, but also I think we have to think about how we can get more surface flows back in some of these rivers because when you have these low flow conditions, it's almost hopeless in some of these areas to get juveniles back out. And also I wanted to touch on another update that we talked about here last year. Dave Cavanaugh and I had a presentation on the you know, Masket River Sustainable Fishery Management Plan for River Herring. This was approved about a year ago by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. So it's an approved plan. It's ready to go. It's really up to the uh, Middleborough Lakeville Herring Fishery Commission whether they want to have a fishery or not. They decided not to have a fishery for 2017. And then sometimes the fish just come by and, and they, uh, they make a decision for you. Here's the graph of the counts in the Namaska River from 1996 to the present. And what you can see in uh, 2017 is really, whoops, sorry about that. Wow, look at that. I don't know if I want to use that. That's yeah, pretty dim as it is. Anyways, you can all see the 2017 point. It was really quite a decline the lowest number in the 20 year plus time series. So really pretty alarming, pretty concerning to see the numbers decline that sharply. There are about eight years of increases after the harvest ban that led to a lot of encouragement. I think it led to some interest in having a harvest in the system. And then in 2017, we had this number that really was shocking. I mean, this has long been considered the biggest run in Massachusetts. In 2017, that uh, honor goes to the Mystic River, where I think there was over 600,000 herring counted. And I think three or four other rivers had more fish than the Masket River did. It's TSM. TSM is the time series mean. The Sustainable Fishery Management Plan, what it does is it looks at different metrics related to the distribution of the counts. And what we selected was 10% of the time series mean would be the harvest level. And that's that blue line at about 56,000 herring that could be sustainably harvested per year from this system. The first quartile, or the 25th percentile, is the, the management trigger, where if, if the number drops below there for two consecutive years, you would cut that harvest in half. <clears throat> you drop that blue line down in half. If you come three years below the 25th percentile, the harvest would be stopped. So that's in the plan, but it's really up to the local fisheries commission whether they want to have a harvest or not. And with those two, 2017 numbers, um, that, that's a level you really don't want to be at. So it, it's unfortunate, but I think um, this is why we have the plan. I'm glad the plan is in place, and it gives us an idea of what 
would be considered sustainable and what would not be considered sustainable. That's all I'm going to address on counts. I'll leave the rest to John Shepard shortly. So I'm going to get into some fish passageway work done in Massachusetts. I want to revisit 2016 briefly because a lot happened in 2016 that's interesting. We had three fish ladders go in places where there was no prior passage. That's fairly uncommon to have that happen. So we have three locations where River Herring can now access where they couldn't before. The Abajona River has a new steep pass ladder. Bourne Pond in Falmouth has a new uh, concrete weir and pool ladder. And Looks Pond Dam in West Tisbury has a new uh, wood weir and pool ladder. And Ed Clark designed an adjustable aluminum frame for that ladder to adjust the ladder elevations or, or slope based on water level uh, conditions. A little more on Bourne Pond because it really was an interesting project. There was a private property owner that owned a pond. It was all his. Upstream of that pond was a 10-acre pond with no passage at this location on the left. And then below that was a dam. It, it, we're not even sure if it was an old cranberry flume or what it was, but it, it almost fully blocked passage. So we worked with the town of Falmouth. They funded the project. We went in and designed a fish ladder for this dam. We removed that lower dam. This picture here is the, the, uh, the wood form for the concrete fishway with Ed Clark. He put this together in our shop and then disassembled it and then put it in out in the field to pour the concrete ladder. It was a fun project. We used our excavator. It really maxed out our, our capabilities, I think, is what we can do as a small project. It was about $7,000 in materials. It took about three weeks. Remove this lower dam and then put in the fishway here. Another interesting sidebar, the rubble from this project went to the Harwich dump where it's going to be used to deploy an artificial reef off the coast of Harwich. So we got rid of this concrete that was in the way of fish and we'll use the concrete to help fish habitat out in the ocean. So we're hoping that'll happen more as people start to take out dams and accumulate some of this rubble. We can use that for habitat someplace else. We had some monitoring this spring. I didn't see any river herring. Our efforts didn't see any river herring. The town of Falmouth saw some scales. They felt pretty strong with river herring. We did see American eel, and here you can see glass eel scaling up the wood weirs. So again, I think an example of projects that we do fairly well with low cost, decent efficiency, working with towns and private property owners. <clears throat> Another interesting project that occurred last year a long-term pr problem in the Cape is that we're all sand here, and so this sand often migrates and clogs pond outlets, it clogs fishways. It's been an enormous problem, and the solution 20 years ago was to build concrete walls out to try to keep the sand from going in the fishway. And what we've learned is the sand just curls around the concrete walls eventually and clogs the fishway anyways. So Ed Clark came up with a different design, an aluminum chute with a float on it, to keep it up off the bottom so the sand would travel under the, the fishway and reduce all that maintenance that occurs. Of course, things don't always work out the way you want. You, you might uh, pick up, there's a really long fetch here to the northeast, and so when there was wind action and storms, the fishway would gather the air and pitch upward and eventually just come out of the water. And so what we had to do was remove the float. There goes that innovation. We had to do something else. We put it on post. It ripped the posts out of the the substrate, given that, that hydraulic action. And so then we put it on cement blocks, and that worked pretty well. The sand goes under it, and the fish come in and out of it. And it's, uh, it's adjustable, it's removable. We'll probably take it out in a couple weeks and put it in storage. So um, a, a little bit of maintenance involved with it, but I think it reduces that really big maintenance load of taking out all that sand every year. And Mill Creek and Sandwich, it, it, as David said, it's really an interesting model, and I wanted to talk about this and challenge everyone to think about it. In some circles of aquatic restoration ideology, this project doesn't exist. It's, um, it's not a naturalized solution. It's one of those nasty fishways. This project would have a really hard time getting funded in many circles. And yet the town of Sandwich decided to fund it themselves. And so they went out and they used local funding sources, Community Preservation Act, and they went out and did it themselves. They really viewed it as infrastructure, like a ball field or a sidewalk, and they decided we're gonna fund this ourselves. So I think it's a tremendous model of what I think towns need to do. Um, it's not easy, it's, it's, it's hard to do, but these things are very hard to fund through other channels of funding. So 
it's right out there. I want you guys to all go out there and think about it and see if you agree with me. It's, it's a very historic site, so it's very hard to remove the obstruction completely. And uh, I think it's a good example for us to talk about this as a community and think about if we can find other examples where this can happen. Another highlight from 2016, again, we had really, really low flow. It was bad in 2015, it was terrible in 2016. We had some historic drought conditions in some places and, and juvenile herring simply couldn't get out of a lot of systems. And there's some thought the low numbers in certain counts this year are related to low flows in 2013. Well, those flows were nothing compared to what we saw in 2016. So let's see what happens for river herring recruitment a few years down the road. But this is a really common problem. We don't have a lot of water in a lot of these rivers, and yet when nature gives us less, it can be a really big problem. We had our excavator out in the Namaskat River in December last year just to dig a channel to get juveniles out of that system. Um, that's not really a, a practice you want to do every year or try to permit that every year. Okay, let me move on to 2017. This year we've done mostly really small projects that came at the request of towns. And on the left is a wooden weir pool fish ladder put in at Marston Mills River. It's actually in an auxiliary spillway. It's not the main spillway. The town had a problem where fish would show up there and they couldn't really pass that well. And so Ed built this wood ladder. The unique thing about this is again, he has a customized welded aluminum uh, attachment frame that is adjustable to water level. So Ed is learning all the time. He's experimenting with this, and I think it's a nice feature. It's removable, it's adjustable. On the upper right is the Parker River in Yarmouth. There was an existing wood weir ladder, customized little ladder that didn't operate that well in the low flows and high flows. We took the ladder out and we put slots in a flume upstream and created very large pools so the fish could acclimate to the, the different steps and move up this way. That was done for about $300. And then the town of Plymouth asked us to help them. They had a problem where herring were getting caught in the slots next to the steep pass, the Jenny Grist Mill. And mostly during the down migration, adults would flop out and get caught. And it was a source of mortality that really should have been just avoidable. So we went in and we put in concrete. We used 38 bags of concrete. It was, we mixed them in the wheelbarrow. It was a very hot September day and it was just a tough day to work, but it, we got that done. We'll return back to Jenny Grist Mill in a week or so, hopefully, and, and do some more work there with Dave Gould. Gore Mill Pond in Herringbrook in Pembroke. Here's a case where there was a functional fish ladder. The dam is owned by the Brockton Water Commission. If you'll notice, there's a gate at the top of the fish ladder that comes down. It's a, it's a flood control, not a flood control, it's a water operational gate that can be raised up and down. For many years, it was a problem. Fish would come out of the fishway and crash into that gate. And there was physical damage, sometimes mortality. We asked the Water Commission to resolve it. Um, they were not that responsive. So this year, we just went in and replaced it ourselves. Ben Gehagen designed this chute. Ed Clark built it. And you can see we installed it with the help of the Herring Commissioners in, in Pembroke. And what it does is it removes the gate is no longer there, and it has stop log slots that can be used for water control instead of the gate. So we've just eliminated that problem of fish crashing into the gate. So a, a long-term project that should have been done years ago finally took care of that. South River in Marshfield, five minutes, okay. Here's a project where there was really, um, it's an example of not a very good fishway entrance, a little steep. A lot of very turbulent. The second weir is offset to the first weir. And so it was a problem. Fish don't really seem to want to enter this. They are mostly blueback, so maybe there's a problem with the blueback and their preferences. But we went in. It'd be a nice candidate for dam removal, but it's a historic dam. It's a veterans park where they hold weddings. So that maybe is a future concept. We went in this year and we formed up an additional weir and pool and poured it. It was a three day project, $300. And um, we hope we corrected that entrance problem. The Four River Watershed Project, this is a kind of a large-scale multi-site project. It's been going on a number of years. Fish cannot access three locations in the river where you see it is red. They cannot get up there. There's a natural falls, a large dam, and then Great Pond Reservoir has a second dam. And there's a lot of habitat at the reservoir, about 180 acres of highly suitable spawning and nursery habitat. 
The project received a boost this year when Division of Ecological Restoration and NOAA Restoration Center joined the project. And so I think a lot of activity is going to come, I hope. We have some work in the field occurring right now. We have a UMass intern who's working on stream maintenance and some data crunching. And we have another intern, uh, really a, a super intern, Mike Rashardi. He's up in the upper right there, moving 1,000-pound boulders, just moving trash, tires. He's just in the river all the time. So we're trying to gain some momentum. A lot of fish aggregate every year below the natural falls. We'd like to find a way to get them up into the reservoir. And we have two new steep, last la steep fast fish ladders going in this year, one at Little River in Gloucester. Ben Gahagan is working on that one with the town, no restoration center, and some co-engineering and construction. And that one should be fitted. It's been fitted. It should be finalized, you know, almost any day. And then at Great Pond Reservoir in Braintree, the uppermost obstruction in that previous slide, that's going to receive a steep pass ladder really any week now. For both projects, DMF is donating the ladders. Uh, 1.5 sections are going to Little River. We cut one and a half, and the other half is going to Braintree, and there'll be two and a half sections going there. Okay, I, I do want to mention briefly, and I apologize for this short amount of attention, but dam removal has really been a big topic the last couple of years. DMF is not that involved in this project. Our, our role is limited, so there's a lot of partners, a lot of people involved at the state and federal level, local level, and a lot is going on. It's going to really have a positive effect on fish passage. The Cotton Gin Mill Dam, the Tucket River in Bridgewater came out, I think, a week or two ago. Shawshine River has had two dam removals. Hunter's Pond Dam and Bound Brook in Situate came out this year. So a lot of positive activity for dam removal in the state. Coonamesset River in Falmouth has a dam coming out with a fishway. It's part of a really large, comprehensive cranberry bog restoration project. Reed and Barton Dam in the Mill River is due to come out uh, maybe in a month or so. And then two really important high-profile feasibility studies are occurring now to remove High Street Dam in the Town River in Bridgewater and the Elm Street Dam in the Jones River. And I'm sure there's others, so I apologize if I'm forgetting some, but there's been a lot of activity the last two years for dam removal in Massachusetts. Let me quickly mention Dynamis Fish Monitoring. You're going to hear from Ben and John later. I just want to frame the, the idea that we work typically with four species, really five if you include blueback, alewife, American shad, smelt, and glass eel. So we do quite a bit of work with these species. Those guys are going to cover that for the most part, but I do want to mention that we have a new uh, assessment going on for American shad in the South River in Indian Head River. And we're looking at the possibility of establishing electrofishing index of abundance for American shad for, for these species in these small rivers where there is no harvest, it's catch and release because there's no sustainable fishery management plan. So we're hoping to develop an index of abundance using electrofishing. All right, let me wrap things up by talking about our diatomous fish restoration priority list. This is something we use as a tool to help guide our restoration decisions. You might wonder, you know, where do our ideas come from? For the most part, we respond to requests from towns. And so that is really a political process. Um, we would like to build a framework that has a little more technical data behind it. So we have this list that's based on our most recent survey and historic surveys. It's based on our population work with those four species I just mentioned. It really connects to our regulatory process where we're required to work with these fish. And it also involves our habitat assessment. And it does involve all of you because your institutional knowledge is so important in these different river systems. We really depend on that and we use that. And it, it works its way into our list. And the list also connects to a mass DOT GIS data layer, which Mass DOT funded to help them plan for their improvements in their transportation corridors. So it connects the habitats where these fish go to their bridges and their roadways. So um, this was developed in 2005. The NRCS had their Cape Cod Water Resources Restoration Plan. This valuation system was used to help pick projects for that, and it became our pre uh, restoration priority list. There's 13 parameters that we assign values to. It's qualitative. I wish it wasn't, but it is. We add up these numbers. It produces a score, and then we rank them by region. 
When I was assigned to work on this in 2011, I updated it. I added a few species. I added a few conditions. It was very much a, a fish ladder, river herring list in 2005. We now have seven species that are considered in a lot more different types of projects beyond fishways. And so for every location, there's a role in the database. There's about 450 locations that have this type of information. What type of project is it? And what type of score it has based on those valuation parameters? And then it connects to the GIS data layer. So for every one of these dots you see here, that's a row in the data file. Where they're green, that means there is passage. Where there's yellow, there's something that needs to be fixed. Red means there's, there's no passage at all. So for sandwich, you can see in that upper left corner, there's two green circles. There's information, there's metadata on each site and information on what has been done and what could be done at, at this site. So it's a, we hope it's a tool that others can use looking forward. Here's a quick summary of the number of, of locations in each of the major coastal drainage areas. You can see the Cape has 136, the most sites. There's a lot of little herring runs down the Cape here. And so if we look at the projects that have been completed since 2005, here are the percentages. And you can see like for the South Shore, 22% of the projects have been completed. That's, that's a nice percentage since 2005. Then I prepared this slide six months ago and there were 75 completed projects which to me is a great credit to all you that are working on these projects. It's not DMF at all, it's really everybody. It's little fish ladders, it's big fish ladders, it's dam removals, it's all the work that people are doing. And in the six months since I prepared this slide, my guess is it's been 10 projects completed. So I can't even keep up, keep up with the updates. Um, there's a lot going on right now for restoration in Massachusetts. All right, so if I can just conclude on our priority list and let you know where the next steps are going to be. It, it has a purpose of being a guidance tool for restoration, but for me, a, a stronger benefit is to connect this with Department of Environmental Protection's Clean Water Act processes. DEP assess water bodies, and if they find water bodies to be impaired, then they have to do something about it. DEP would like to add fish passage as one of their aquatic resource uses in this process and use our data to help rank these, these water bodies and find impairment and improve impairment. We're working on that right now. If we can make that happen, I think it'd be a very important tool. I would love to update this. We're trying to update the third version now and then make it available to everyone for everyone to use. And again, it's just one tool of many. It's not the tool, but it's one tool. And then I think I'd like to see it contribute to a discussion on how as a community we can pick these projects. Um, to me, right now, the, the process is overly political. I'd like to see it become a little more transparent, a little more technical-based, and I'm hoping this tool might help with that discussion. <clears throat> so, if I can hop up on a soapbox in conclusion, I've been around the waterfront for a long time, and I'm seeing changes that I think we all are aware of. I think we all understand these things. We talk a lot about fish passage. And we talk about offshore mortality for river herring. These are important issues, but I also think there's things happening that really are just dramatic in, in my view of having seen these estuaries, these you know, riverways, the ponds, the lakes for you know, 40 plus years. Things are a lot greener than they used to be. I think our coastal populations have really increased. And with this, we've seen a lot more nutrient loading. And we're seeing the habitats these fish depend on really become eutrophied. And I think this is something that we all are aware of but I think we all need to buckle down and find ways that we can make differences at the local level. And the same for surface flows and groundwater. Um, we're just not seeing as much water in some of these systems. We're using more and more water for this increasing coastal population. We're changing our groundwater quality as well. And these are ma major issues. And so these are things I'd love to see some more progress on. And from the policy standpoint, once again, the, the example out here of Mill Creek, what was done, is a fantastic example. I think we have to consider some of these um, fish passageways as infrastructure, just like we consider ballparks and sidewalks, and try to find ways to fund them locally, because we have a responsibility to do so. And again, I'd like to see an open and healthy uh, discussion on how we can improve our restoration planning coordination. Thank you. take time for maybe uh, one, two questions. 
True. Excellent question, Drew. Um, last year we sat down with the Division of Fisheries Wildlife, the Division of Ecological Restoration, and a few others, Trout Unlimited, and we talked about it. And DMF went back and developed a protocol, which is published and it's on our website. And what it does is it gives recommendations on how to go about this work in a way that would be um, supportable for other aquatic resources. So that's a guidance tool that's out there. I, I don't think we've come together fully with this practice, because in my mind, it, it's something that just, it, it, in some ways, we're essentially making a management decision to give up on a herring run if we do nothing. And so I, I think that advocating doing nothing is, is really, in many cases, not the right solution. But I think we've had some great discussion. We have that guidance document available on our website. And I think this is an excellent forum to continue the discussion. I apologize for the, the projects that were not up there. I, I tended to focus on projects that DNF was centrally involved with, and there's obviously a bunch out there that we're not involved with. It's an excellent question, Eric. I, I think that, you know, years ago we just viewed that eels would find their way. And the truth is they, that's not the case. Glass eels cannot navigate through an Alaskan steep pass. Excuse me, they can work their way up through certain weir pools if they have lower dimensions and low elevations. And so it's something that we're starting to pay attention to. And I think it, it's something that we have to look for opportunities. We've had a couple of recent fish ladders built concrete weir and pools that, that do not pass glass eels. And so we're looking for opportunities to improve that. We will put in eel passageways. We've put in eight in the last 10 years. They've passed a collective of over a half a million glass eels. And I feel pretty good about that, but that's never the first solution because you want to find ways to not put in a mechanized structure to pass eels. So it's a good topic. I didn't really touch on that very much, but I think with every site, we have to look at it and think about, okay, what can glass eels do with this location?